good morning again, everyone, and welcome to this Earth Stream here at the University of Copenhagen, where we will have our guest uh, talk presenter for today, which is Valentin Troll from Uppsala University. Hello, Val, and uh, it's so good to see you. So, um, yeah, without further ado, I should think we should just get into it if you want to present what you are going to talk to us about today. Yeah, uh, thank you, Marie, for inviting me. Um, I should maybe also add a little disclaimer here, first of all. I mean, I'm not a professional here. I, it's very, very flattering that you asked me to kind of uh, uh, show some of the little tricks I acquired over the last, I guess, two years since I've been playing with this. And uh, I realized that um, a lot of people seem to struggle with uh, what I would call simple little technical things or, or uh, simple little ideas sometimes. And uh, this is really what I'm going to hopefully be able to help you with today. And um, I am not in the slightest claiming this is the best way of doing it. I can't promise that. There may be other ways of doing it. But I can show you a little bit what I am doing and maybe you get some inspiration from that. So I have prepared a few slides and I'll try to go there now. So uh, let me see whether I can share them with you. So I hope you can, uh, you can see my slides now. Yes, it's working. It's working, great. Um, then uh, let's see whether I can actually see you as well. So anyway, here's a very short intro about myself, first of all. And um, well, I'm an igneous petrologist and I'm working here at Uppsala University in uh, Sweden. And uh, I guess I had an interest in kind of presenting and things like that already as a, as a young boy. I was a member of the theater and acting class in school and I enjoyed this greatly. So during my PhD, I took a two week intensive course with uh, uh, West German television. And uh, I thought this was really useful. I learned a few kind of interesting tricks there. And uh, this has kind of stayed with me. During my time here at Uppsala, I've been working with Swedish television. I had the Japanese television here. Discovery Channel was here several times. National Geographic has flown me out to the Canary Islands last year. And I also have been reasonably active for Uppsala University and a number of outreach activities. For the last one and a half years, I've been involved in a kindergarten project back home. And uh, this has now been recently nominated for a national award. So I'll keep my fingers crossed, it would be cool. And um, so since 2018, I do also little educational videos for my master class. It's a very small class, so I'm not aiming at huge views. This is really just to make the teaching a little more attractive and uh, save myself a little bit of work as well. So here I'm doing some uh, uh, teaching on petrology, of course, but also on raw materials, volcanoes, and on sustainable development. And um, let's see whether I can move this forward now. Oops, yes. In the outreach kind of effort here at Uppsala, they gave me this title here as the person who actually speaks with rocks. And uh, well, it sounds a bit odd, I find, but uh, it seems to kind of work for the outreach people here. So, and this is what I'm going to try to bring across today as well. So, my topic here is making simple rock and outcrop educational videos for online teaching. And uh, to get started, well, I believe that technical mastery is, is, is not crucial here. So, you need to have a few skills, but uh, I'm not a technical wizard, certainly not. But um, I, I came across this saying, or uh, this uh, phrase from the Edda, and I thought it was quite... Um, eye-opening. So it says there, as often as not, it is the warrior with a blunt sword that wins the battle. And uh, it's, it's effectively an equation. It says there's a 50-50 chance that, it's, that, that either this one or the other one might take the victory here. And it's not down to the quality of your tool necessarily. So technology is not always the crucial factor. You can certainly do it a lot more professionally than uh, compared to what I do. But uh, I believe it's the content that matters and uh, this is a useful contribution towards teaching. So um, I also find that loads of people have all sorts of reasons, thousands of reasons in their minds why it's difficult, why you can't quite do this. And um, I guess you have to be ready to put yourself out there. And uh, you will likely get some positive and some negative feedback and that's part of the game. But um, 
I guess there's a lot of little tricks that you can use. And uh, this gets, I feel, a little bit over the, the slightly uncomfortable aspects that sometimes come with being in front of a camera. Since I'm doing this, uh, I also realize why real actors, professional actors are paid quite highly because there's a lot of uh, yourself that you need to put into that. So, and uh, let's come to the next one. Here's a few things to get us started. So what you really need is no more than a smartphone for most occasions and a good idea. You uh, might be well advised to have a second person there to move the camera uh, or you can use a little tripod. And I'm gonna switch off the share function now because I'm gonna show you my little tripod here. And uh, where is it? Here, stop share. So, and um, I hope you can see that now. So here's my little tripod and it's not very sophisticated. It's very simple. It's 12.99 bucks on Amazon and um, it actually holds the iPhone. So it has this little holder here. And you can put your iPhone in there. And uh, this can then be remotely operated because it usually comes with one of these little remote controls. And uh, there you can actually film yourself or film someone, uh, film an outcrop. And uh, this is indeed very, very useful. It's not very expensive. Most of us have a phone. So the camera quality is pretty decent right now. But of course, if you have a better camera and want to use it, that's surely fine as well. So I'll go back to my slide now. Let's see if this works. And Marie, please let me know if it works. So can you see my screen again? Yes, it's working. Great. So uh, I think the one important thing that I learned from um, this two week intensive course with um, the German television was uh, you really need to have a think about for whom you are presenting this. You need to check your audience so that you can clarify your main message and uh, have a little goal for your clip. This is crucial to get started. And if you work for master students, obviously you need to bring in a different level as uh, for example, if you work with kindergarten kids and uh, your audience will be thrilled by different things and you want to kind of check your audience carefully. Otherwise you're delivering the wrong product for the wrong audience potentially. To get started, I personally think you can avoid cuts. Cuts are a lot of work afterwards. If you need to stitch video clips together, it's a lot of effort. So I have taken inspiration from directors like Kurosawa or Warhol, and it's not about whether you like them or not, it's more about that their technique was, uh, at least in, in certain e uh, episodes of their careers, they have uh, tried to use as few cuts as possible. It makes the filming rather authentic and uh, you will have less work afterwards. So if you have a good idea and you can film so for three, four, five minutes at an outcrop without cutting, that's really good and that saves you a lot of trouble. So um, it's not a lack of skill necessarily to not cut a lot. It's uh, not bad style, I feel, and uh, you can make your life a little easier. You can also make very short clips, for example, 30 seconds there, 30 seconds there, and then stitch them together. The simplest tool for that, I think, is if you just uh, use your uh, Windows Movie Maker or something like that, that you have on, on, on all PCs these days. If you want to use some other software, of course, that's fine. Um, then uh, you can add little things there. You can add short text. You can um, make overlays, labels, links, etc. And uh, then you can save it as a little movie and then upload it on YouTube. Now, when you're out there in the field, I should stress that one of the biggest problems I've encountered is actually the wind. So if you have wind there, then the sound recording often suffers. And I talked to um, a camera man or, um, at, um, at the National Geographic kind of shot we took in, uh, in, um, in the Canaries. And he gave me these little fluffy stickers uh, you know, the big, um, the big sound microphones outside, they have these really fluffy kind of things. And uh, you can have them as little tiny stickers. You can buy them online. And uh, if you put them over your little mic on the phone, that actually takes the problem down by a fair bit. If the wind is too strong, then, well, you might not be able to do much with the sound on that occasion. But you can always voice it over later on if you're absolutely desperate. So um, I think also it's important to have... Uh, 
a nice presentation style. I think being approachable is what's uh, usually advised. And um, this is, uh, of course, uh, useful. If the audience kind of doesn't find you too intense or so, then it helps. So one of my former supervisors, he sent me an email about some video I shared with him recently. And uh, he said the following words, and it's not to praise myself, it's more like to kind of give you a feeling what audiences look for. And what he said was, uh, and it's all done with an ease, friendly, enthusiastic, uh, though not bombastic informal style which uh, conveys great enjoyment on your part. So this is, I guess, what you really want to kind of aim for. And each of us will have a different style. We all have personalities and personal styles. So uh, you have to kind of find your little rhythm there. But uh, if you enjoy it, I think it comes across. So let's uh, move to this one here. Um, and, well, uh, yeah. Before you move on, we just uh, got a question in the chat. Sure. Um, so Karen asked these little fuzzy stickers if they have a technical name, uh, if you want to search for them and buy them, or is it like fuzzy sticker is the technical term? Oh dear, oh dear. It's a good question. I don't know the technical uh, name for them, but uh, I can have a little look and uh, I can get back to you, Karen, if I find something. I'm sure I can find the product and then hopefully they will uh, kind of allow me to come up with a name as well. But I wouldn't know from the top of my head. I'm not that techie yet. Thank you. Okay, great. Then, um, yeah, uh, I shared this, um, this uh, book tip with you, Marie, a little while back. And this is something that uh, I came across the other day. And um, it's called Contagious. It's uh, a little study on uh, what actually works. Why do certain things go viral and others not? And it's uh, written by uh, Jonah Berger. And he comes up with these key points. And I'm just gonna quickly run you through them. This is not my thinking. This is kind of uh, Jonah's thinking. Uh, but he says, uh, what works kind of on YouTube and similar things is, uh, first of all, social currency. If there's some knowledge that makes uh, you look smart or cool or whatever, then uh, this might actually be something that's passed on and shared around. And uh, this is the kind of thing when somebody says to you, did you know, or have you heard, have you seen that kind of movie or clip or whatever, then uh, that's something that, um, yeah, people get interested in. But for our purpose, that's not so, yeah, I'm sure some students will exchange it amongst each other, but it's not the main goal, I feel, at least not for my videos. You can also use triggers, and uh, this is really mental associations that we make. And uh, coffee and cake is one of them, wine and cheese, beach and sun, and gin and tonic. So um, if you can talk about one, then, uh, or start with one, you can actually lead into another. If you have little associations, this might be good to, um, to get across uh, certain concepts to students, also to really get a message into the long-term memory. Uh, this helps a little bit if associations that are already there can be used. Emotion. Um, uh, about a year ago, I talked to a friend from GFZ in Potsdam, and. Uh, he uh, told me that their head of department told them that maybe they need to do more things with kittens because this seems to sell well. And uh, indeed, emotion, that is something that works and emotional things often get shared and passed on and people will memorize kind of the emotional experience they had. So kittens, puppies, helping those in need, these are things. But again, I personally think for what I'm doing, this is not a, a hugely useful thing. Now, what is uh, next on the list? Um, well, visibility. If you see things very frequently, then uh, it helps people to kind of memorize it. And uh, that works quite, uh, quite well, actually. Humans have a tendency to imitate. And we often copy what we see. And my personal example is my, my kids at home. If my five-year-old kind of scratches her knee and needs a plaster, I promise my two-year-old will come and say, I want a plaster too, and we call the phenomenon baby too. So, and uh, even though she has no injury and doesn't fully comprehend that this is not strictly a nice experience, but uh, she wants to kind of share this experience nevertheless. So uh, this is something that uh, can work, that people want to share into an experience. The most important thing, however, I feel at least, is practical value, and this is what I focus on. If you're useful, if it's useful for your audience, then 
this catches on. And uh, then you can actually get away with being not super techy here. So focus on being useful is my recommendation. And this is what I'm trying to kind of do. If you sprinkle in a bit of the others, this may actually make your video a little better, but the usefulness is I think the key criteria. So um, then the final point uh, that Mr. Berger kind of uh, puts forward is uh, stories. If you have little stories, legends, anecdotes, well, they're often vessels that carry some lessons, often a moral lesson or some experience that uh, some mistake that was made, etc. cetera. And um, this might teach uh, your audience how to do better, how to improve something. So sometimes it's useful if you slip in a little bit of a moral lesson, uh, but I prefer to, this to be rather subtle. Uh, I mean, I'm not kind of, you know, a moral teacher, I'm a geology teacher. So this was the key things there. And uh, oops, um, then um, I use YouTube and uh, I kind of want to talk a little bit with you about YouTube now. You need to create a YouTube channel, I think. And even if you don't want to share your videos publicly, i.e. on the entire internet, uh, if you just want to have them for yourself and for your teaching, it's still very useful. But be aware that all your kind of videos you upload on YouTube, they are they're stored somewhere on some giant server. In my case, in Europe, it's actually in Holland, this server. I think in the US, it's probably in Silicon Valley somewhere. But uh, Google effectively has your videos. So um, the main advantage of Google is, however, you can access your clips on one platform and pretty much from anywhere. So I can, uh, and I'll try to do that later. I'm gonna show you some little clips um, where you can kind of, you know, share my YouTube um, storage, if you will. And uh, whether these are publicly available or not, it doesn't matter. So you can be selective about this and uh, you have it all in one setup. And you can then remotely teach even from, I guess, yeah, Miami Beach or wherever you have internet access. So as long as you have Zoom and your videos on YouTube, this is very, very handy. Now, upload. And um, I, uh, if you like, I can show you a little up to upload. I prepared a video and uh, um, I did that yesterday. And uh, here's a few kind of things. Once you upload a video, YouTube will ask you some questions. It will ask you, is it for kids or not? If you don't want comments, then clicking it is for kids is quite good. Then people cannot actually write pleasant or not so pleasant things. Um, they can still give you likes or not, but uh, you kind of might get around some unpleasant comments. Sometimes you just get them randomly. I had one person from Argentina being really stroppy with me because he happened to be called Valentin Tron and he said, I'm stealing his name. Uh, I couldn't really help it. I, uh, I felt I have right to my name as well. So um, I uh, just clicked on uh, the kids kind of thing for that video and I never heard of that from that person again. So um, then you should click private first. Don't release the video immediately. Use it as a repository, first of all. And then once you have it uploaded and you have it on the private uh, storage domain, you can actually edit your video. So uh, the edit stage is quite important. There you have opportunities to add music. You can cut the clip. You can add text if you like, and uh, you can even upload a sound file that you have recorded where you can talk over your video. So if you use music, for example, um, anything you play in the background while you record your video, it might actually have a copyright uh, claim on it. And usually you get a copyright notification. This is not serious. All it uh, does is it basically tells you if your video ever makes money, the money will not go to you. It will go to the copyright holder. So I don't think it's very serious because you need a lot of views and a lot of subscribers to actually make money on YouTube. I, uh, I think I'll, I'll never really get there. This is also not the purpose. So, um, and uh, before I show you some things, uh, maybe I'll quickly get out of this share mode for a second. And uh, now, if you like, I can quickly kind of get you to uh, my YouTube interface and show you a little upload if that's useful. And uh, let's see, I need to swap the share thing now. So now, Marie, can you see my, uh, my uh, YouTube channel interface? Yes. Wonderful. So up here, there's a little uh, camera and it says plus, and this is where you upload a video. So if you kind of click there, you go for upload video, 
and uh, then uh, you get this kind of thing. You can either drag a file there or you select the file. And here, I'll just click there and I'm gonna take this file I recorded yesterday and it's gonna start uploading it now. So, and indeed you get some questions here. So here you can give a title, but you can also edit this later. This happens to be on Karuna ORS. So I'll just uh, write there Karuna and I'll do the rest later. Here you can kind of say more about your video and uh, then you click for next. And this is now where it says, is it for kids or not? Well, Karuna rocks well, it's not strictly for kids. So I'll just click that and I don't mind any comments there. And then uh, it's giving you some extra information here. I usually click past this and here it says private versus public or it doesn't appear anywhere, which is not so useful I find. So I usually start with private. If you want to release it to a certain date for Christmas or so, you can also schedule that. But uh, well, that's not quite what we're after here today. So, and uh, then you save that and you can close that. And then uh, usually here it says, uh, 0% processed means the upload is already almost done. And uh, after a little while, this video appears here and then you can actually kind of work with it. So this is really how simple the upload is. And then you can edit it and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll uh, switch to my other screen now. And uh, we are back on uh, this one, I think. And um, Yes, so we've gone through this and I've showed you a little upload, so you don't need to be intimidated by this at all. It's uh, quite straightforward. And uh, here we're now reaching the point of some little video kind of styles that I think are useful. And there's quite a variety of things. And um, what I kind of like is to play around with little things. And uh, you can start with just having a rock there. So this is a bit like uh, this up here. You're behind the camera, you talk into the microphone, but you don't have to be seen. So it's the rock. And usually what I use is a little old chopstick here, and that's my pointer. And I actually got some comment from some Asian person realizing that it was a chopstick. I thought it was quite funny. So, and uh, yeah, of course you can take a better pointer, but I'll show you a little example of this later on. You can also show a rock suite. I mean, sometimes I go to my rock store when I've laid out some rocks and you can show a whole series of rocks from a certain outcrop. And then you can have several rocks um, and a presenter. So uh, say for example, you have rocks in front of you and uh, you talk about them. If the camera is beyond you, beyond the rocks and you, then this works quite well. I also sometimes show little experiments, often they're quite simple or silly experiments. I sometimes use little toys from my kids common things like that, or we do little crystallization experiments in class. So I'll show something like this in a minute as well. Outcrops, and this is important because we're now approaching the summer, and I think many of you will have a chance to go to the field. So if you have photos from field uh, seasons or from past field seasons, you can make a slideshow. And you can either do a voiceover or add music, and uh, this is useful and practical. So you can show this to your students and you can have question and answer sessions. You can ask them to observe certain features. So again, I'll give you an example in a few minutes. I also personally like drive-by clips. Um, there you either have the camera pointing outside the car and you're passing some information or so, or you can actually have a conversation inside the car that you record. Once you have the little tripod I showed you earlier, this works reasonably well, actually. Then uh, if you are at an outcrop, you can talk um, towards the camera with the rocks behind you and then you can show features. But for that, you, you, you almost certainly need a second person. I, um, I think it's not too hard. I have uh, recently recorded a video where my 12 year old girl, uh, she was recording and I, I thought she did really well. I hope to show you this example a little later. And um, then you have presenters at the outcrops. I sometimes even work with several presenters if you have a colleague there, you can even have a discussion at an outcrop. So this is quite engaging for students as well. And the final thing, and I've just seen Todd there as well, and I did one with Todd as well and a little while back, and with Nina and uh, a few other uh, people. Uh, it's, it's interviews, talking about things, talking about rocks. You can even show rocks. So um, this is often very engaging because uh, Humans like to watch, you know, humans. I mean, uh, things that don't move are often not quite that spectacular. So uh, I think uh, you get a lot more attention from your students if you show people interacting. 
you can do this in the office, you can do this in the field, or in fact in the car, and um, there is really no limits. So this gets me to the final part of the little presentation now, and that is some examples, and I need to share my screen again, and we need to move to the other screen now. So, and uh, hopefully that works. Marie, can you tell me whether you can see the other screen now? Yes, it's uh, working. So, wonderful. Here is a very simple example, and uh, my plan is to just dive in for a minute or so, even less than a minute. And uh, here is a little rock I recorded in my mind. And Montagna Blanca, it erupted in several pulses, but uh, broadly speaking, it erupted about 2,000 years ago. The eruptions of Montagna Blanca were witnessed by the locals. This is why we have potentially even ash and uh, pumice involved. The more the fragmentation in, we see, there we are. We see the, the glass kind of in the process of being uh, moved apart in uh, the process of expansion. So this was one example and I'm gonna move straight to another one. Here's a plutonic rock now. And uh, this is from Scotland. The previous rock was from Tenerife. So I'll quickly dive into this here as well. Uh, this is done in my office really right next to where I sit is reasonably simple, but if you have a good camera, then uh, the quality A bit about good. plutonic processes. And uh, here I've got a specimen from the Isle of Rum. And this is a very intriguing specimen. It's from a layered plutonic intrusion. We talked a little bit about that in the lectures. And uh, the Isle of Rum is dominated by a tertiary uh, layered intrusion, it's about 60 million years old. And what we have here is a unit boundary. And uh, here in the lock, olive in crystallization. Down here, we have a little bit of a trough, and this is quite intriguing. It almost seems that, if this is true, that um, we had a bit of a topography at the bottom of the magma chamber. Now, let me turn this rock. So I think you're getting an impression. This is kind of simple. You are not visible, so you don't have to be too intimidated. You can only be heard, your voice can be heard, but you can actually go into quite some detail. And this is very useful for practical things because certainly now in Corona times, you cannot really hand rocks around in class, but uh, this is a good experience for students. And uh, you could also have a question and answer session afterwards. So this I think is a useful thing. Let me move to another example. This is now a suite of rocks. This is rocks from Chile I picked up last year from uh, an ore deposit at El Aco Volcano. So I'll quickly gonna dive into this video here as well. So today we're gonna look at the El Laco rocks, which uh, we brought back from Chile and uh, we're a little slow. We picked them up in summer, but uh, it took until now, early November, until we have them all kind of wrapped out and uh, um, ready for shapes. I guess one gets the idea that this could have been uh, formed from fluids or even a liquid as such. Some people speculate there may have been magnetite magma. Other people argue this is all a precipitate from hot fluids. Some of them... So I think uh, you get the idea about a kind of uh, you um, not being visible, but the rocks being in the, in the center or being center stage in these kind of videos. I think for teaching, these are perfectly adequate and uh, they can be done with rather little effort. Now moving on to the next kind of type of video I sometimes do, and this is me in my uh, uh, previous office, and uh, here we have a suite of rocks, and uh, this in case, uh, in this case it's basalt lava types, it's uh, a rather low level class for which I did that, so uh, let's dive in there for a second. Agree. Some people say Pahoy Hoy is the lava on which you can walk with bare feet. Other people say Pahoy Hoy is the description of an even surface out on the sea. I think the latter is probably more correct. Um, as opposed to AA lava, which is the one you cannot walk on with bare feet, or the rough surface of the sea. So again, I heard these two interpretations. Um, maybe so, and uh, if you have a good camera, and uh, if you're not kind of on your own, you could, um, you could actually have the camera moving towards the rock. Um, if you are alone, then you can move the rock towards the camera. 
but uh, that's often a bit more tricky because you're not entirely sure whether it's in focus or not. So uh, there, my tip is to kind of leave the rock a little bit in front of the camera, give it a few seconds because then the uh, smartphone cameras usually adjust the focus again. So uh, let me quickly move on to other examples. And that's a little experiment I did in my garden um, two winters ago. And uh, this was then for a kindergarten project. And actually the kindergarten kids redid the experiment. But uh, let me quickly kind of bring you in there for a second. So cool. Incredibly cool. Philip, you're trying this at home. Have a grown up, safety glasses, and well, that's all. So you get the idea, and uh, this is just a kind of um, baking soda and vinegar volcano, and uh, um, the kids in kindergarten had great fun. They made a sand volcano at the time. They didn't have so much snow than we had in Sweden. Uh, but uh, this is a great learning experience. And then, of course, you can look at lava structures and things like that. So it's a great thing for a, ba a basis for discussion. So here's something I used in my master's class to discuss uh, blob models for plumes. And uh, when I kind of um, use my little lava lamp here and I put this on, uh, on um, uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> different timing, then uh, you can have a very speedy kind of uh, process. This is half an hour of lava lamp uh, in about a few minutes. And uh, here you actually see it pulsing. So uh, this is really interesting because this might explain or at least provide a discussion why we have island chains and not a continuous ridge because uh, plumes must be pulsing. And uh, this is something that opens up a discussion, for example, with the class. So um, then what I also do is crystallization experiments. And uh, I often get volunteers from the class. Again, one needs to ask, of course, whether they're OK with being filmed. Oh. But uh, here's one of these examples where we that had uh, crystallize. a little rock and, and we had some uh, liquid that we wanted to crystallize. And if correct, if the marsh type crystallization is correct, we would expect that this rock now acts as a major nucleation surface, as opposed to layers of crystal that would rain down. So, and I uh, then uh, a week later record the result, of course, and then you can share this with with the class. And here's the result. Question asked is: How will it crystallize? Will it um, form crystals in the solution that will then rain out, or will the crystals form on the substrate? And for that. So, and the big learning uh, message here, or the takeaway message is that crystals are not forming free floating and rain down, but rather they often grow on a substrate and they make little crystal gardens at the bottom of a magma chamber or at the sidewalls. So you can visualize this, and this is often something that students retain a lot better. So then um, let's move on to some outcrops. And here's a simple way. This is pictures I took a few years ago from a place in El Hierro in the Canary Islands. And uh, this is just a slideshow. So, and of course you can have voiceovers or you can add extra text if you want to point out certain features. And uh, if you make them short, two, three minutes, then uh, these are great visualization tools in your practical class or even in your lectures actually, because Zoom allows you to quickly switch from screen to screen. So uh, this is a useful thing I feel. So here's one of these drive-by things. This is now from Chile and this is a Mar volcano. And uh, here you see the um, blocks, the thrown out blocks. It's a block field around the mar here. And there's some nice volcanoes in the background. And here we're just driving around the mar and I'm trying to explain some features here. We're here at uh, Cerro Orvedo Mar in uh, the Northern Chilean Andes. And uh, this is a rare example of more mafic magmatism. This is why we have come here. You can see dark rocks in the foreground. This is some of the eruptive products of the Mar. And uh, there's a large block field just in front of us. 
So uh, this is an option, but this was in the early days. I made the mistake of having the radio going and I got a copyright notification because the doors were playing. And uh, yeah, so if this video ever makes any money, I won't get it. Um, but um, it has, what does it have? 116 views, so I'm miles away from making any money with that. But given that my class is only seven students, uh, the petrology class, I think 116 is good going. So then uh, let's quickly move on. Here's another drive-by I did, and uh, this is now a solar, and solars are increasingly important. It's a key source for lithium. And if we want to electrify our traffic, we need loads of lithium, at least given the current technology. So here I was uh, explaining a little bit while driving by. The crust means that there has been recent evaporation. This particular solar is also quarried for um, getting the salty material out, particularly for lithium and uh, also for boron. So, and then I think um, um, a really interesting thing I, I often do is I record little videos just of outcrops without saying much, and I'm asking the students to make observations, and then we discuss that afterwards. So here is uh, what people have interpreted as a tsunami deposit on Tenerife, and uh, other people have been very critical about this, and uh, here I let the students kind of have a look, and I've kind of chosen a, a somewhat kind of uneasy music for that in order to get the, the students kind of a little tense on this so that they're engaging a little more. So uh, here's an impression of this type of thing. And uh, I find them very useful. You can um, uh, get more information across than with simple slides. And um, students uh, often respond really well to uh, this visual stimulation, I find. And then, of course, they will say, or they will, they will report that there is large class and boulders, and they're smaller, and there is boundaries in there, and all that kind of thing. And uh, it's interpreted as an inflow of a tsunami and a backwash of a tsunami, just to kind of give you that background. And whether this is true or not, I can't tell, but uh, there's a nature paper on that. And this is a great discussion with the students. So uh, let's quickly move on. This is now filming done by my 12 year old uh, daughter. And uh, this is a little hill fort in Sweden. And uh, the local people there have uh, seemingly put uh, the walls on fire in order to kind of make them melt and uh, uh, agglutinate a little bit. And uh, this is uh, one of my most recent ones because the travel restrictions allowed me only to go around here in Sweden. So have a little look at this. And these walls themselves, but in order to make them more durable. And here's the evidence. So let me quickly take you there and give you a little impression. So here's some of these larger blocks that you see and they are welded together. And here you see almost lava-like textures down there. And it's all very bubbly, so loads of uh, volatiles came out of these rocks. And the rocks here are mainly uh, Precambrian gneisses and uh, granitoids, and uh, partly also glacially derived, partly from local outcrop. And uh, this was piled up here and then eventually welded together in the upper wall. And if so, um, let's see, I need to get out there for a second. Need to get back in. Sorry, I made a mistake. If I take you over here, so and um, let's go back here. So here uh, now, let's see. Yeah. This is the next one I wanted to show. And this is now also in Sweden. This is on Alnö Island. And Marie, you've been there with me. And this is now the type locality of Alnöite, which is uh, um, uh, an alkaline um, rock, uh, ultra, um, uh, ultra mafic rock. And it's, it's, it's part of the Kimberlite family. People have been looking for diamonds, so. 
We are today at the type locality for Almeroid. Well, there's a car passing, give us a second. And Almeroid is a Kimberlite type rock, but it's distinct because it's got these large flogopite crystals. And I've got uh, Peter Creston with me today, and we're going to show you some of the admittedly sporadic outcrops we have here. So, Peter, would you... Streaks of mica, it's a biotite, uh, inclusions, and on careful examination one might find grains of olivine and diopsidic pyroxene. This is so this is kind of um, um, the rock business. Let me get to the next one. Yeah, and that is interviews. Um, I didn't choose any people from Copenhagen, although I'm very grateful for the interview Todd uh, gave me and also Nina. But uh, here's one with uh, Kathy Cashman. And this is about um, unexpected events. So I'll quickly let you look into this as well. Center there, Quetzaltenango. Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, you know that earthquake? really well covered in the Guatemala City newspaper. There was lots of information about it. That area was important because it has uh, it was big coffee plantations. Uh, so it was I didn't know about that aspect, but yep. uh, it, and, it kind and, of makes sense. Yeah. yeah, so very well reported. And um, let's uh, move on. This is one I did in Reykjavik um, in January. And this is with Gabriela Stockman. And she has Ikaite here, which is a really strange thing. It formed in low uh, temperature situations. This is from Greenland and here's the freezer uh, where the sample is stored and uh, um, there is strange bacteria in there and she has been informing me about this. It's uh, Some people have speculated it might be alien. It's more of a joke here. I don't think they are alien but uh, it's a dirty ice if you will and uh, it's known as the mineral ecoid. So here have a little look at this. In Greenland so Quite unique. I will just put this one back. So it looks wonderful. Maybe maybe yeah. uh, show it a little bit closer to the camera it? if you'd be yeah. so good. Here. Look at this. Here and then see if we can show you some of this green stuff here. Maybe aliens living <laughs> in here. <laughs> so here, here in clearly you see yeah. these are the cyanobacteria. They grow here a few centimeters inside. But there are also lots of bacteria in wow. here. Assuming just for a second they yeah. do not come from outer space. They would have to <laughs> yeah. be some very ancient form of bacteria, I would assume. Yeah. So, and uh, I think here's my very last example. And this was just because we missed our opportunity window the day before because of a PhD uh, party. And then uh, we did a little interview on Icelandic volcanoes here with Tortoros on, on the way to the airport. And I thought, what are the uh, consequences? Um, I know that after, for example, the Lackey eruption, there was um, 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 starvation in certain parts of the country and things like that. Uh, back in the old days, the, the consequences from these eruptions, how severe were they? It, well, it, it varies from one eruption to another, but most of them uh, uh, caused really fine asphalt, which is actually packed floor, flooring bits. Yeah. That's the thing about Icelandic mountains, they're actually quite fluorine rich, right? And uh, fluorine, of course, exalts from the magma upon eruption, but it quite often will then react with water vapor in the atmosphere or other chemicals and, and adhere to the... So that was all the examples I have prepared, so I'll, I'll stop the sharing kind of uh, mode now and um, let me just get this over here. So this was really kind of what I have done and I hope that you got some impressions and maybe some little inspiration there. And uh, I guess I'll close it here. I think I said enough. So guys, if there's any quick questions, I'd be quite happy to answer them or at least try to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Valentin, for sharing all of these video examples and for your, uh, your thought process behind all of the videos and getting started with videos. It's really, really great. Um, and yeah, so I think if we should just like do a round of questions, maybe 10 minutes time-ish, and yeah. Todd wanted to start. Yeah, sorry I came in a bit late there, I had to deal with something else, but um, so I don't know if I missed it at the start, but the, what I noticed was that when you are, for example, showing the, the close-ups of the pumice and stuff like that, that it, uh, it looked really good. So oh. it's a nerdy question, do you, do you have a special camera that you're using or 
Is it just? Um, it's a very good question. I uh, was saying it at the beginning. For most uh, kind of things, all you need is an iPhone, and uh, you need a little tripod like this one here, and you get that on Amazon for twelve ninety nine. And most cameras are good enough. The camera away from you is usually better than the one towards you. So uh, use it this way. But the video I've shown you was actually done with a camera I have on top of my computer right now, which was, uh, I think, about $70. So it's not a super expensive camera. But uh, this one is very good for close-ups. So uh, you can kind of get cameras with decent um, uh, resolution at a reasonable price. So uh, you don't necessarily need to go into hundreds and hundreds of dollars for that. I think that's a thing of the past almost. Does that help, Todd? Yep. Um, so I have a question actually, Val. Uh, and yeah. We talked a bit about it uh, like, uh, before the meeting, um, but this process of planning a, a video, um, both, of course, it's often, as you mentioned, in the context of some class you're having on the side, so that kind of gives you like mm -hmm. helps with how to plan because it's like depending on what you need uh, for the class. Um, but generally, like when you're filming the videos, um, do you like how much do you plan them beforehand, or do you like is it mainly improvisation regarding the description of the rocks, or like what's your process? Well, I guess everybody works differently, and um, uh, in my case, I I usually. Um, um, I start with a little idea, but then I, I develop it with time. If there's a class uh, where I need to kind of uh, show something particular, you have to speed up this process. For other things where it's not so important, it might take a little longer. I have, um, there's one thing I really want to do a video about. Uh, do I have it here? Oh, maybe not. I thought I had it in the office somewhere. It's, oh, actually, let me get it for you. So I'm back here. So this is one of my problem kind of candidates. I'd like to do this kind of uh, obsidian video on this little statue I got from Mexico. And uh, you can see a little layering in there and all that. But I have not really found the right angle to kind of sell it and bring the problem in. And uh, just because it's cool, it's not enough. I don't have a teaching context yet. So uh, I was thinking about degassing, but then there's better samples to discuss this degassing like the pumice earlier. So um, here I, I'm struggling. So there is a struggle involved. Uh, for some other things, it comes a lot easier. And uh, sometimes I, uh, I uh, need to kind of try once or twice. I'm not happy with what I said or the way I said it. But then after the second or third time, you get better because uh, you can use the first failed attempts as a kind of praxis or a practical kind of approach. And uh, then just be aware that you can just delete them and uh, there's no loss. So uh, yesterday I did a Karuna video on my Karuna samples and I have to admit I had to start three times. Once somebody knocked on the door, another time um, I kind of got something wrong and then the third time it worked. So uh, yeah, you need to give it a little bit more time than just the few minutes of the final product. Uh, how, how do you use uh, these videos in your teaching? I mean, you, you uh, show some in your lectures, but do you tell them now for next time you have to watch this and this and, or how do you use it? Yes, um, I started off, uh, it, it's all changed now with uh, the current situation, the Corona situation, because now we all use Zoom. And as I've just shown, you can actually show these videos while you give a Zoom presentation. So that's really cool. I think it's really kind of uh, made these videos a lot more valuable. But previously, um, what I've done is we have this thing called Student Portal, and it's a software platform where I can message my class and where I can uh, distribute handouts and things like that. And there I would send links. And uh, this was particularly useful when uh, the students had to prepare for exams. In the exams, I usually give a hand specimen and a thin section, and then there's some geochemical information, and then they have to write something about that. So just the way how uh, I would discuss the rock uh, is very useful for the students, they said, because first of all, they get exposed to the rock again. It's a good reminder as well. And of course, it also helps them to realize what I would like to hear. So uh, this is the kind of thing where I feel the little rock videos have been really good. 
When it comes to outcrops, uh, I often kind of ask them to uh, look at a series of little videos and I uh, kind of, uh, if I have a two hour practical and I kind of use the last half an hour to say, look, here's a bunch of videos, have a little look, we discuss it next time. And uh, this is kind of rather flexible. There's many, many uses. I'm, I'm sure I haven't explored all of them, but this is how I have been using it. Does that help a little, Nina? Sure, yeah. Right. So now you talked about having these like relatively short videos of approximately five minutes. So like how long would it take you to prepare like a five minute video approximately? Do you use like a day or half a day, an hour? Like to, of course you have to prepare the content of it first, right? But from like the, the work process kind of starts to, so you can send like other video to your students, for example. Yes, I would say if I spent more than half an hour on um, uh, one of the little rock videos, which is three to five minutes, then I've actually overspent my time on this. So uh, the thinking process, I'm not really counting in. I have to think a little bit beforehand about, oh, I want to show this rock. This is the features I want to show. But the actual recording, even with two or three attempts, it shouldn't be more than uh, you know 15 minutes and then setting it up. Um, maybe I can show you. So here um, I have my little kind of place here and usually I put my rock here and I have a little tripod here. The camera is on there and uh, that's really kind of how the thing is recorded and uh, it comes directly onto my computer then. I don't have to kind of download it from an iPhone or so uh, with this little camera. Uh, the whole thing is super fast. So in half an hour I guess even with two attempts, I can be done with uploading it. If I don't want to have any gimmicks like music or things like that, then uh, no more than half an hour, I would say, for a little clip like that. That's actually, that's really surprising. I would expect it to take longer, but that's a really, really like fast uh, workflow compared to like preparing uh, like longer lectures or even just preparing uh, exercises for like a classroom. That's a pretty, that's very, very you yeah thank you and uh you can you can reuse it it's not that you have mm. to redo it every year you have it and then uh, you can recycle it from year to year sometimes you may want to improve it and re-record something but uh uh of course you can spend more time and you can make it more technically um, um advanced and things like that but uh if it's just about the content as we discussed about the things that really you know catches people's minds I like to be useful mainly, and if it's about the information and the features of the rock, you can do this rather simply, I believe. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so YouTube's whole business model is centered around holding viewers' attention for the longest amount of possible, you know, keeping them engaged, basically so they can watch adverts. But you, you as, a, as a creator of videos, presumably you get some metrics back about your own videos. I yeah, wonder can happen, yeah. in that as to, to figuring out what are the, you know, what are certain types of stars of presentation that keep uh, people engaged? Yes, I didn't really talk much about that and I offered Marie, maybe that's a thing for another kind of conversation. Once we are releasing these videos onto, um, you know, into the internet, uh, everything is different because then indeed you need to kind of look for what catches people's attention or not. Most of my videos are mainly for the students. I release them, uh, but I am not really after clicks or subscribers in this context. I, I, I enjoy if people enjoy my videos, but uh, I am not really, I'm not trying to make money with it. If you want to make money with it, then you can use the analytical functions in YouTube to really see how long you retain audience attention. You can also see how, um, how your video works often you find that a new video is attractive for a few weeks but uh, then the interest drops off for instance so uh, um, once your kind of customers have seen it mm. then uh, yeah I have the odd little kind of strange thing as well uh, on television I um, with my kids I recorded um, uh, an episode of Simpsons uh, at the volcano where March is kind of trying to, um, um, you know, save one of the kids from the lava flow and things like that. It's one of my most successful videos. I mean, uh, of course, the copyright thing is uh, I will not get any money if it's ever going to make money. But there you can really see that uh, the attention is really held because there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of action in there. 
with my own videos, I, I still have to work on this. I'm not that good as the producers of The Simpsons, obviously. But uh, this is why I said, if you have movement in there, if you have action in there, it helps a lot. A static rock, people get very bored after about two, three minutes, I have to admit. So, and uh, you want to have also some humans. Humans love watching other humans. We, we, we love people watching. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you kind of have uh, yourself in there or a colleague or so, then often it kind of retains the audience a little longer. Does Thanks. that work for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking not so much about making money, but just the, as a side benefit of, it, of uh, to see whether, um, uh, yeah, what, whether it was possible to kind of extract information about how videos work even for different audiences yes uh if you want uh, we can have a quick look at uh, at the analytics thing i can pick a video from uh, from my uh, from my kind of channel if that's okay marie do we have time for that um yeah i guess I mean, so i mean i don't mind don't do this uh, um that's okay you, i'm i'm quite easy about this so. so the next meeting i'm aware of doesn't start until two o'clock so unless someone has something else that starts now uh, we should have time. So let's see. Um, let me just uh, find something. So screen share. So uh, can you see the screen now? This is the video I showed earlier about the little Mar volcano in um, in in Chile. Uh, it's kind of rare because most rocks in Chile are uh, high silica. This one is very mafic, so this is why it caught our interest. And uh, you can go here to the analytics or the edit video function. If you do the edit function, then uh, it gets you to this interface here where you can do all sorts of things, change the labels, change the text. You can uh, have an end screen where you do more advertisement and things like that. You can choose whether it's for kids or not, and you can put in search words down here to kind of uh, get more interest. And you can then look at the analytics here. So if you do that, then here you see the audience retention. So usually, I guess, uh, here after about half the video, I mean, you're down to a certain number of people. So if you make it too long, it doesn't really work. But what's also interesting here, this would be my average video. Um, so. Uh, most of my videos kind of uh, peak at about 40 kind of views. That's the kind of uh, the dull rock videos, if you will. But uh, this one here got a little bit of a jump. Maybe somebody used it for teaching somewhere else. I shared it with a colleague in Chile. And then here it got another jump. So you see that uh, it's not always uniform. So sometimes uh, you create new interests just by being out there. And then a video that has been dormant for a little while, maybe like a volcano, can actually become, uh, you know, rejuvenated after a while. Yeah. So um, this is the kind of uh, things you can do with this. And uh, there you can analyze your kind of performance, if you will, and improve on that. But that's a lot of effort. And I'm trying to kind of keep it low profile because uh, whew, uh, then... Uh, yeah, I would almost need to look for a different job if I want to do this for all my videos. So. It also on the the other side of that coin is that it, there's an art to pitching things at a at a level. Obviously, you have a you do things for a wide range of audiences, but maybe I mean one of the advantages of YouTube is you can all, you can also allow videos to find their own level. You, um, Absolutely, own um, agreed. You can uh, you can kind of um, you can tailor it, and you can get really good at this. My wife, she worked for Google and uh, she tells me uh, one of the key things is the, uh, the keywords, in fact, the search terms that you put in. If you want to have a, a kid's audience, then you put in slightly different search words than for your master students, for instance. I think kids would not respond to clinopyroxene or things like that, while master students would potentially look for clinopyroxene and gabbro or something like that. So uh, there. There's a lot of possibilities, but that's almost beyond the kind of direct to kind of use in teaching. But it, it's, 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 it's good to kind of get your head around it. I agree. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Valentin, from, uh, yeah, from all of us to, for like, joining us at this talk and talking through your uh, video projects. Um, it's, been, it's been great. And yeah. 
Well, thank you, Marie, for the invitation. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for the interest. And uh, yeah, also, thanks, Johannes, for putting up the, um, uh, the link to the little fluffy sticker. So that saved me five minutes. So Karen is happy. You can see that. So guys, thank you very much. I hope it was useful because um, uh, you can play around. I, I guess my big advice is don't be shy. Just play with it. Experiment with it. Try to watch your content. That's the key ingredient, I feel. And the rest is is secondary and you get more comfortable with it as you go along. So anyway, I guess uh, it's me done. So thank you very much again. And yep. um, I deserve thank a new coffee, I guess. So all the best guys. Have a thank good you. summer. Thanks. See you. And, uh, thank you. Yeah. And, bye -bye. I hope you also, yeah. and I also hope you also uh, enjoyed yeah, coming here and having this uh, oh, talk. I did, a bit certainly. different yes. from your normal talks, I suppose. <laughs> I guess, well, yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Thanks. And Johannes and everybody else who helped. Much appreciated. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, and uh, see you next time. Thank All you. the best. Good luck. Bye-bye.